Okay, cool. Take it away. So, well, I mean, I said very confidently, but I can share my screen. Yes, we can see, we can we can see, see your it? screen. Okay, perfect. So, um, I don't anticipate this taking the full hour, but uh, it's very much a um, brief introduction to using R and Twitter together in one sort of ecosystem. There is, um, I mean, there's lots of reasons why you'd want to do this, but I thought that I would take a, a quick straw poll to see how many people here actually use Twitter. So if you just uh, raise your hand or give me a thumbs up with one of the reactions if, as to whether or not you use Twitter. Three, four. OK, so a good proportion of the uh, group uses Twitter. So with that in mind. Um, why would you want to interact with Twitter? So why do you want to interact um, with Twitter and uh, using R? Well, there are a number of reasons. There's no there's no text on this slide as to why or not you might want to do it. And that's because the reasons are almost limitless. It depends on your interests. So for my own particular interests, I interact with Twitter using R in a very specific way. So the conventional way to interact with Twitter would be to harvest data, so scrape data from Twitter for some kind of analysis. Now that would typically be done as far as I've seen so far in the literature with social scientists rather than um, experimental biologists, which is uh, predominantly what I am. Um, so uh, there are some different ways to use this. Now I'm going to show you a little bit of both today uh, in this session. The thing that I really want to show you is how you can collect data from Twitter using R and then I also want to show you how you can push data to Twitter from R. Now in order for all of this to work together, so Twitter and R do not talk to one another um, you know, very, very easily. You have to exploit something called an API or an application programming interface. I pluralized this here to APIs because there are several different Twitter APIs that you can access. And uh, the API that you do access ultimately depends on the data that you're trying to harvest uh, from Twitter. So different uh, different types of data will have a different API. However, you can broadly get away with using the regular developer API because that gives you pretty much uh, uh, good access to the majority of uh, Twitter's data. So what is an API? Well, it's at its most basic, um, in its most basic form, it's just a protocol that governs interactions between websites and the users. So really it's a way of um, communicating information between websites and users uh, in both directions. So you can um, download data from a website to a user or you can upload uh, data from a user to a website. So it's a two way street basically and uh, it's all about how we can uh, transfer data between those two different uh, places. So an API is not that dissimilar to a website um, or sorry, a web browser, but it does have a slightly different purpose. So with a web browser, it's all about rendering visual content so you can actually see the, the information presented to you uh, typically as HTML. Um, it's HTML format that's rendered. Now, an API is all about managing and organizing the underlying data that uh, goes towards generating the visual content um, and basically allows you to access that data in a relatively straightforward manner. Now APIs are really great and there are lots and lots of, of APIs available to you. So many websites, uh, many of the big websites, so places like GitHub, Facebook, Twitter, they all have APIs that enable users to um, interact with their data. However, the majority of those tend to uh, be restricted. So not everybody can access all of the data. You can't just log in and start 
harvesting data from the from the website, you actually have to get permission to to do this. So for Twitter, you have to register on their developer platform, so developer.twitter.com. And if you go to that, you can sign up for their API. Now, there's no real uh, restrictions on this. Signing up doesn't um, mean that you you know you may not get access to use it. They pretty much give access to everybody. You have to justify why you want access, but I'm not entirely well, I'm not entirely convinced that they actually check what um, what those uh, requests are actually for. Because I'll just put you know gobbledygook into them sometimes, and uh, they've still been approved. So you can pretty much put what you want in there, and they tend to uh, to to approve it every time. Now, these API logins that you get given usually are valid for either six or twelve months before you have to renew them, depending on the depending on the platform. For Twitter, you get a twelve month. Um, uh, period in order to use that API before you have to refresh it. Um, and that refreshing process is very easy. It's clicking one button and it doesn't doesn't tend to be a, a major drama. Now, registering for the APIs um, is a bit of an involved process in so much as there are lots of steps to it. So uh, the way that I learned to do it was by following this step by step guide. We're not going to go through that today because I don't anticipate anybody here following along while we do this. But if you go to the step by step guide here, you can follow uh, follow through and I will give Ed these slides to upload um, to his site at the end of today, along with the script that we work from. So if you follow those steps in there, you should be able to access the uh, the developer platform for Twitter relatively easily. So that's the Twitter side. What about the R side? Well, there is a number of different R packages that are available to um, interface with R and um, give you access to R. The one that I've used most and the one that I like most is called um, R Tweet, and this allows you to pull data from Twitter, so you can uh, harvest as um the data that you wish from twitter but it also rather uniquely and this is what the other r packages don't do it allows you to push data to twitter so you can run a script execute it and it will generate a a a message to um onto twitter as a as a twitter post so i think it's the best thing to do is um, just show you how how uh, how it works. So what I've got here is a very basic markdown script. But before I go on through the script, is there any or are there any questions up to this point, or are we relatively happy with what I've briefly gone through? Hey Joe, could you say just a few things like the motivation for? Um automating this is is this something you've done for fun or, or is it something you actually use on your own twitter account yeah so um just a good question so for my actual main twitter account uh i don't use any automation but that's purely because um i don't have any need to automate that account but i do have a second account um uh which i can show i think i've got it up here this one the HAU weather forecast um, account, which uh, I don't do anything with. It's completely automated in so much as uh, all of these tweets are generated automatically, uh, periodically throughout the day based on an R script that runs automatically. Uh, and the reason for making this one is that I was teaching myself how to automate a Twitter account because I thought it might be useful in the future. Um, and the second reason was that I'm too lazy to check the weather forecast, so this will ping me in the morning with a weather forecast directly to my phone. Does that answer your question, Ed? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I mean, I noticed the, one of the reasons I ask is um, I'm only intermittently and lightly active on Twitter. I wish I had more time to play around on Twitter, but I noticed that there are some accounts, even some really good ones that I like, that um, I suspect are just bot accounts. Yeah. Like, 
like putting out, um, you know, some on the quality side or academic papers, some on the less quality side or like cat pictures and, you know, bug, uh, you know, insect porn pictures, really high resolution yeah. insect pictures, stuff like that. Yeah, so uh, there's one, a, a relatively um, good one, actually, that does exactly that. It's called um, Suzuki Eye Papers, and it just tweets out the latest um, Drosophila Suzuki Eye Papers. So uh, it's a uh, fly pest of fruit crops, but it's a really, really important pest, and there's lots of research on it. Mm. And it's really hard to keep on top of the research um, that comes out for it. So this person, I'm not actually sure who it is, has generated a bot that basically just tweets out the new papers on a daily basis. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, there are there are lots of um, ways you can use this to automate aspects of of Twitter, and you know, I think it was, was there four or five people here who use Twitter. I mean, it depends on what you're using Twitter for, I guess, to a certain extent as to whether or not you need to automate it. I automated it as a fun side project. Um, when everyone in my house had COVID and I didn't want to do anything to get infected, so I stayed away from them basically. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's what you can use to do to push it through. I mean, while I'm here, I may as well show you before I show you how to harvest data, the underlying script that runs all of this. So for this one, this this particular Twitter account is all about pushing data. Um, from a uh, repository in GitHub to a Twitter account. So we're not harvesting data here, we're generating data. Now the Weber bot is unusual actually in a couple of ways. It's using multiple APIs. So obviously we're using the Twitter API because we're interacting directly with Twitter, but I'm also harvesting weather data from another website called um, Open Weather. So uh, I also have to have an API there to to access their um, to access their data. So the GitHub repository for for uh, for the weather bot, but is relatively simple actually. It contains um, three R scripts that I use, and one that I use as a bit of a development script for just testing stuff. Um, but there are three main R scripts in here. Some of the stuff you can ignore, so you can ignore most of this other stuff. The ones that we're interested in are these three here. And each of these scripts does something different. So the current dot R script basically tweets out the um, current weather conditions every four hours to the through the Twitter account. The daily forecast does a single tweet um, in the morning that gives me uh, this little snapshot here. So today, the weather forecast for today is light sleep showers with highs of eight degrees and a 76% chance of precipitation. And the pollen forecast does what it says on the tin, gives me the pollen forecast uh, levels for today. And that's a single tweet that's tweeted out an hour after the, um, the daily forecast. So if I just click into one of those for a second. So inside this, it's just a, a regular, um, our script, there's nothing fancy in here, except for the fact that we are making reference to one of the API keys. So when you sign up to a developer's or a website's uh, API uh, as a developer, you get given a unique key. That unique key basically allows you to to access the um, access the data through their API. So it's like um, a, yeah, a key to unlock the door basically to, to the data. Then I've um, got some custom functions in here for downloading data, um, which I've done. So you get the data typically from APIs in a JSON format, uh, which uh, you can manipulate into a, a data frame to do stuff with. I'm not going through this in any detail because it's not overly interesting, um, except maybe this part, I guess, where I uh, create the web link to get, actually generate the, uh, the API, so a, a web address. If I go to that, it's got a JSON uh, file with all of the data in it that I'm uh, interested in. From that, you, know, you can create a data frame and uh, you can do the various bits you need to do to it. So converting uh, wind speed into miles per hour, for example, sometimes uh, changing the temperature data from Fahrenheit to Celsius, 
that kind of that kind of thing. But then in here um, we have the interesting bit, which is defining the tweet function. So that's taking all the information that's downloaded and actually turning it into a tweet that would be suitable for Twitter. So I think this is what you covered a couple of weeks ago, Ed, with the uh, if else functions. This one's a highly convoluted one and probably would not be recommended to do it this way. It's but, impressive. Um, it's, I, I mean, it's, I'm amazed it works, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, 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 um, it does the job. So it turns the codes that are provided by open weather. So they don't give you a description verbally. Um, they give you these little codes. So I need to turn those codes into the actual weather um, that I want to report it. So if the weather type is 201, that means that it's thunderstorms with light rain, 202, thunderstorms with rain, et cetera, et cetera. So there's that one there. There's another one that um, basically generates emojis. So uh, you'll notice that there are little emojis in the uh, weather um, forecasts. That's because Twitter seems to contain about 90% emojis and GIFs. So I put some emojis in there um, using the emoji package, which is a Hadley Wickham side project, but uh, very effective to use. Again, another um, if else um, statement, basically just changing the wind degrees uh, into actual directions um, here. So but this it goes from being an abstract concept to something that's uh, more understandable. Now, all of that is fine. Um, and that's just generally uh, just creating information um, for the actual tweet. Now, to actually tweet this, we need to do a couple of things. The first one, we need to create a token, and that token is our key to access um, Twitter. So when you sign up for their developer account, uh, they'll give you um, a consumer key, a consumer secret, an access token, and an access token secret. That information is given to you and is um, basically the only way that you're able to access their API. So we store these or we have to store them in uh, this um, token in order for our tweet to actually be sent uh, up to Twitter from R. Now, what you can't see here and what I'm not going to show you is because this is recording. Is that these are not anywhere in this script and that's because it's a publicly accessible document. So uh, I've stored them in the um, dot R environ file, which um, basically is a file that's only on my computer and um, I'm able to read information from that into the R script um, in secret. So I can say that I'm going to use the sys.getenv function in order to pull the thing that I've called Twitter consumer key from that file uh, into this script so that I can use it. It's a neat little hack that so that you can actually put this stuff up in a public GitHub repository without having to give away your secrets, because if people have those, in theory, they could use them to post their own tweets, uh, which could be, you know, anything it could be, you know, um, uh, not very nice content, but they decide to to tweet on your behalf. So always keep these things secret if you do this. And that's a neat little trick to uh, to do that. So the actual meat and how do you actually put all of this together to turn it into a tweet? Well, you use a uh, function from the um, from the uh, R tweet library or package called post underscore tweet, and then uh, we're posting a status, so we call it a status. Uh, we use the function paste zero to actually join lots of things together, and I've got some generic text that doesn't change. Uh, every day, so the weather forecast for today is, and then I add the weather type, so that's the if else function here. So it will take whatever's in here, place it in there with highs of maximum temperature, precipitation probability, and then an emoji. And then the token is that token up here that we've defined, and then that's it. You run it, and it will uh, it will post to Twitter. So if I execute this script manually, it would uh, it would post a tweet to Twitter. Now, I don't want to do that every morning because the whole point of automating this is that it does it on my behalf because, frankly, I'm too lazy to check the weather forecast. So 
I'm definitely too lazy to boot up my computer and run a script every morning to check the weather. I may as well just check uh, my phone. So how do we automate this whole process of posting information from an R script to a Twitter account? Well, we can exploit something called uh, GitHub uh, workflows, which is basically um, a way to um, run a virtual machine and execute scripts automatically um, uh, on a particular um, time frame. So if we look at the daily forecast again, so all of these are in uh, .yml uh, files, and they're really, really simple to set up. Um, so you just have to name what your action is going to be. You have to schedule it using cron. So this one executes at 545 on a daily basis. I think if I go in there to edit that, it will actually tell me how to do that. So setting up these crons can be quite challenging because they don't work uh, under sort of standard convention. So you can change these and this will tell you uh, when it will be uh, running. Uh, there are lots of tools out there to help you um, figure out the correct cron um, syntax to make sure you're executing it at the same time. So we have this little cron scheduler, so it schedules the uh, function uh, to, uh, sorry, schedules the script to run on a daily basis at 5.45 a.m. We have to set up a virtual machine. Uh, I've just gone for Mac OS because it runs the fastest through GitHub actions. Also, I'm led to believe I read that in a blog post and GitHub confirmed it, but that's the most um, effective way to run these. Sounds uh, like to me. So it sounds what? Sorry. It's like propaganda to me. It's like propaganda. Well, I think the Linux ones are the slowest ones. I don't know why, uh, but GitHub seemed to suggest that they were. I'm not quite sure why. So we run it on the Mac OS um, virtual machine. We have to call in um, those secrets um, again. So the secrets in the script, obviously I've uploaded that script to GitHub now. What I've not done is upload my um, R environ file because that contains sensitive information. So I've stored these uh, same secrets uh the consumer key for twitter the secret consumer key and the open web api key within uh github itself if you go to the settings of your um repository go out to secrets go to actions you can add secrets here obviously you need to make sure the names match the uh the ones in your in your script or else they won't execute correctly and then you need to um set up the machine server that's running R basically, so install R. Um, so you, this line doesn't change, that always stays the same because that's just a generic actions um, 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 step. So anytime you start one of these files, that's already included there automatically. We can set up an instance server that's running R. So this will have R installed on that virtual machine. We then have to install the individual packages here um, independently so we can't install them within the script itself they have to be um, installed externally so the ones that i'm working with the rj uh, json io package deplier lubridate emoji r tweet they will have to be installed and a quick way to install all of those is um, to do this but then include the dependencies so you can really reduce your um, uh, workload each of these actions or steps has two parts to them, a name, what it's actually doing, and then the uh, the run, which is uh, how it's going to do it. So you have to tell it that it's an R script that you want to run uh, and whatever the conventional um, R syntax would be to install those packages. And then finally, we have our last step, which is to create and post the tweet. So we just run R script again, and then we just name the R script directly that we want to run at 5.45 a.m. So in this case, it's daily forecast. And then that will um, post this uh, tweet out at that time in the morning. Now, if I click on this tweet, what you'll notice is that it says that it's um, at 6.56 a.m. posted. Now, the reason for that is that um, British summertime, the clock's changing, has messed up all my uh, timings. So these timings are based on UTC rather than BST. So I need to play around with this to get this back into sync. So this should be running 
at um, 6 a.m., not 7 a.m. basically. Well, no, sorry, should be running at uh, 5.45, sorry, not 6.45. So it's a little bit of an issue. Now you'll notice that um, this is set to run at 5.45, but the tweet, uh, let's assume it's uh, was posted at 5.55. You'll notice there's about an 11 minute delay between the post and the execution. That's because this process takes a little while to get it through. So uh, setting up the virtual machine takes a few minutes. Installing each of these packages takes a few minutes as well. Running the script is the shortest part, but you won't get a tweet that runs exactly at 5.45 because it, there's a lot of um, behind the scenes work to do um, prior to it appearing on Twitter. So that's one way of using R and Twitter uh, together. So this is all about taking data. If, this could be data stored on your own computer or it could be data from another source like uh, open weather and uh, turning it into something that you can um, post onto Twitter. Now, if you're interested in what I've done here, um, you are more than welcome to take a look at it in detail. The, it's, it's all public um, so that people can have a look at it and, and play with it if they wish. You can fork it and have a look. The link's in the chat if you wish to go and have a look at it. It's by no means perfect, and this was a uh, COVID pet project that uh, I was playing with. Are there any questions on this bit at all? Very interesting so far, Joe. I have a question. Um, I may have missed it too because I was kind of getting spammed a little bit while you were, you were on here. But I think I, I think I followed uh, everything you said. But the part that I'm missing, the part that I'm still thinking about, is um, where is the uh, where does the R code run? Does it run in the GitHub workflows? Yeah. So uh, it runs up here in this little tab called Actions. Hmm. So. Um, I have three workflows basically. So I have a current um, workflow, a daily forecast, and a pollen forecast. And each of these executes uh, in here. So if I click on this, it's running in that virtual machine. And the R code uh, runs um, down here in this section here. So it okay. basically just runs the script. So it's all run automatically with no, uh, yeah, no input basically. I see. And do you, with a, like a free standard uh, GitHub account, are there some limits on their virtual machine that you can do? Good question. So if you have a public repository like this one, there are absolutely zero limits on virtual machine usage. If you have a private one, I think you get something like a thousand hours per month or something like that. Oh, OK. Wow, that's still pretty generous. Yeah, so it's pretty generous. And I, I, I haven't explored GitHub Actions to its full extent, I'm sure. But uh, I've been thinking about how I can use it in my own workflow and something that I'm probably going to do. And maybe this could be an, uh, a Harrog meeting in the future is there's um, a database of pesticide products so it's updated on a monthly basis. But it's a real pain to go and check it. So what I might just do is harvest the data on a monthly basis so that I have a record of that uh, in GitHub that I can just keep um, sort of like a um, uh, like a bit like a uh, Git repository and so that I can go back and see any changes over time. Yeah, that's cool. You could even make a make a shiny dashboard or something that people other people could see and use it. Exactly, yeah. So that's, 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 that's my next uh, project to think out how to use actions a bit bit more, uh, you know, of a useful way, perhaps. That's super cool. Um, is it time for questions or do you have more to show us? I've got, so that's how you can push data to Twitter. I've got a little bit of an R script to show you how to harvest data from Twitter into R. Yeah, cool. So um, I can make this available as well. This is just a, it's a very, it's a much longer R script, and I won't go through it. So what I've done is I've gone through and uh, commented through it, and um, you know, given quite a bit of information about um, what I'm doing as I go through. So I'll just show you the, you know, the first few bits of it, and then you can go off and uh, explore it on your own if you're interested in it. So the first bit's really quite boring. It's uh, you know, installing the actual package either from CRAN or from uh, GitHub directly. 
loading the package, which obviously everybody here knows how to do, but I will do that myself. Bit of an odd quirk um, for harvesting data. So pushing data to Twitter, you need to have that token. For harvesting data, you don't need to have the explicit um, token if you run this package at the same time. So this is for browser based authentication and you only have to do this one time. So when I'm running through this today, it's not going to ask me for. Um, for this information, but what this does is it allows our studio to talk directly to your um, your default web browser. Now when you run a um, a R tweet function for the first time, it will take you to a page on Twitter to basically allow access to um, to the API. So you don't have to mess around with all of those different secrets. Um, in, in this instance, you can just access the information directly. So it's a nice little um, shortcut if you just want to harvest data from Twitter. If you want to post data, you have to do it the long winded uh, way, unfortunately. So the R tweet package um, has lots of um, different functions in it. Obviously, there's the post uh, tweet function we've just looked at with GitHub Actions, but there's also ways to um, harvest uh, data from uh, Twitter as well. And the basic way to do that is to use a function that search underscore tweets. And all you need to do is execute um, that function with whatever it is you're looking at uh, looking for on Twitter. So in this case, I've put R stats, data and science. So if I execute that, it will pull down some uh, tweets. And if I open up that, uh, this is the kind of thing you get. Now you might be thinking, OK, there's only 100 observations here. Surely there's more than 100 tweets um, that have this topic in them. And yeah, you're absolutely right. The default position for search tweets is to just pull down the most recent 100. So uh, it only gives you 100 tweets initially. Now you can change that and I'll show you how to do that uh, later. So you get the first 100 um, tweets basically, or the most recent tweets, and you get lots of different information. So the user ID, for example. Now this is just a numerical version of the Twitter username. Status ID, which is to do with the tweet and when it was created at. You get the text of the tweet. You get the source, so how it was posted to Twitter. Um, how many characters are in there? Uh, lots of NAs and that kind of thing. Is it a quote? Is it a is it a retweet? Um, how many retweets there were? Hashtags that are present in the um, in the tweet. So this one had R stats. Uh, this one down here had two. So uh, deep learning and analytics. Um, NL proc, NLP data visualization. So you could pull all these bits of information out. You could build word clouds around hashtags. You could look at trends, that kind of stuff. You can pull out URLs. Um, from the tweets as well. So there's lots of different things you can pull out from it. Now, the problem with doing it like this is that what you're actually searching for here is R stats and data science, data, sorry, and science. Now we may not want to do that because we may just want data science and R stats. So how do we get rid of that implicit and between the words? That may be a problem for us. Well, we can do it in several ways. You can do um, single quotes around your double quotes. So that will just pull out data science and not data and science. Or you can um, escape the quotes with a backslash um, and some more um, quotes. So if I run this, hopefully, there we are. So if this is just looking for data science again, we've just got the 100 tweets. And um, what we've done there is then just look for data science tweets rather than data and science tweets. So might be worth just running. No, hang on. I just run this data science. I'm sure we'll get um, quite a lot of uh, rubbish in here, um, but probably has nothing to do with uh, data or science. So this one up here, visualizing uh, decision trees. Uh, yeah, that's probably uh, relevant. Um, machine learning, that's definitely relevant. 
Justin Trudeau. I mean, uh, uh, Trudeau, sorry, I think he's the Canadian Prime Minister, so uh, probably going to be no good. So here we are. So uh, Justin Trudeau, when will you let go of your vindictive, divisive and childish policies against unvaccinated? Science and data clearly shows now your policies make zero sense. So that tweet has been pulled out based purely on the word science, which is obviously totally irrelevant to what uh, we're looking for. We're interested in data science, not anti-vaxxers. So uh, this one, you can see these tweets are much more relevant. There's no um, no junk in here. This is all to do with uh, data science. So that's how we can be more prescriptive in our searches for finding data on uh, Twitter. We can also look for keywords um, so we can look for and we can add and phrases um, to our searches so we can look for R stats, Python and data science or sorry, R stats and Python and data science uh, separately. So we can run different iterations within search tweets to meet our specific needs. If we want to increase the number of tweets we pull, so for example, this one here is now going to look for R stats, um, tweets with R stats in them. And it's going to pull out 10,000. I'm just going to drop that down. Oh, I'm just going to drop that down to uh, 1,000 because 10,000 will probably take too long. So it's going to pull down 1,000 tweets that are related to our stats. So now you can see here we have uh, 1,000 tweets that are related to our stats. Now, there are a couple of points to highlight with this search tweets function. You have a limit of 18,000 tweets per 15 minutes, which uh, seems like a lot, but it potentially isn't if you're harvesting a lot of data. And the downside or the major downside for me is that you are only able to harvest tweets um, up to six days uh, in the past. So anything beyond six days is untouchable with a free API. If you pay for the developer uh, for another developer API on Twitter, you can go back further in time. So if you were going to do a project like this, you might want to consider setting up a GitHub Actions to harvest tweets, um, you know, on a daily basis or a weekly basis, so that you can uh, capture tweets over a more extended period of time for um, analysis. There are lots of other things you can do in terms of um, searching for. Uh, tweets so you can filter out whether the user is verified or unverified. You can plot directly from the um, uh, the R tweet um, function. So visualizing the number of R stats tweets uh, on an hourly basis requires us to use the uh, time series plot function. This is, whole thing is built on top of uh, ggplot, so the plot should be quite familiar to you and um, um, quite uh, easy to edit. So uh, maybe that isn't the best one to do. So it seems like there's not been a huge amount of tweets about how we did only harvest a thousand. So if I run that, it'll take a second to run it. But while that's running, I can answer questions up at this point, if you like. If there is any. While that's running, then, if there are no questions. Any, any questions, Gary? <clears throat> Uh, just tumbleweed dead. Some I bet there is um there must be uh in the the license for use there must be something about um preventing someone from setting up a dev account, harvesting the data, but then selling it on themselves. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely uh yeah, there are definitely lots of rules and regulations tucked in the terms and conditions. Whether or not anyone's read them, I know I haven't. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there, there, there definitely will be um, there definitely will be rules um, rules preventing that. I suspect. I'm, I'm trying to think of some uh, examples of um, like reasons where where someone might want to <clears throat> buy that access. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, one of the reasons. I mean, one of the ways I learned how to, or the reasons I learned to use this. Uh, search tweets function was uh, there was a big debate about neonicotinoid pesticides and uh, whether or not people perceive them positively or negatively. So I harvested loads of data with uh, what mentioned the word neonicotinoid. Uh, it's quite a specific word, so it's quite easy to get that information. 
and then we did sentiment analysis on it to see uh, you know whether it's positive or negative perception of it. And that was the main reason that I learned learned to do this. So yeah, it looks better. So if I harvest more tweets over a longer period, uh, you can see what the number of uh, R stats tweets over an hourly basis uh, over the last I don't know day or so. Uh, it's quite high. You know, well, there's a lot of people tweeting about R stats. Clearly, it's peaked uh, today. Uh, not sure why it would peak around lunchtime uh, today. Any thoughts, Ed, why there would be so many? Um, yeah, I don't know. It's global, so I I think that if we, I suspect if we looked at a longer catch, that that's just normal variation. That's my guess. Yeah, I suspect you're probably right. So you can uh, you can you can visualize that kind of information quite easily. Something was a bit more advanced, but we. We, you know, we, we haven't got time to look at today is like um, visualizing networks and retweets and things like that. So you can see uh, how information or disinformation propagates out from a particular source, um, which I think is quite cool. And I'll be happy to sh show people that uh, in more detail. So there are lots of iterations of search tweets um, and I've given you lots of ways that you can use them so you can um, filter for tweets that only contain links, uh, news articles, uh, video, that kind of thing. Um, you can filter here, so um, you can harv harvest from specific users. So I've pulled out Harper Adams Uni, uh, Ed, and myself, and you can um, harvest out information um, just from those users as well if you wish to see what's going on there. Harper Adams has posted a lot. Uh, I've posted a little bit over the last few days. Ed has posted uh, much less than everyone else. But you can do lots of these quality, uh, not quantity. <laughs> I'm all about quantity. It's all about spam. Ed. <laughs> How you stay in the uh, public uh, consciousness. So you can do that kind of thing. You can also get timelines. So what people a single uh, user has been doing. So I just chose the CNN news one because I was looking at something on their website uh, earlier because they were posting about agriculture. So you can just pull their most recent tweets. Um, over a set period of time as well. And there are lots of ways that you can do these different things. You can pull out people's favorites. So um, uh, I don't know what I've favorited on Twitter in the last few days, but you can look to see what um, tweets people have been favoriting. So um, lots of colleagues from Harper. So Jane um, Headley, John Reed, B Bites, no idea what that is farmed insect welfare, these kinds of things. So you can um, you can harvest this kind of information uh, from Twitter as well. So there's lots of things you can do. You can get lots of information about you know people and um, who their friends are. So you can um, build networks of people and how they know each other and that kind of thing, uh, followers, that kind of stuff. So I've got lots of more information down here if people want to go through it. You can look at lists streaming tweets, that kind of thing. But that's all I've got, Ed, if, uh, if that's OK. No, that's great. That's um, I think you've given a lot to think about. That's uh, kind of a whirlwind tour of some of the possibilities. Very, very interesting. Thank yeah, you. This is all basic stuff. And, you know, if, you, if people ever wanted to do a deeper dive on network analysis and sentiment analysis, this would be a good platform to build from. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think well, I, George did something, but the 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 kind of things that you've shown us um, here are much more advanced in the automation. Yeah, it's um, it's like peeking underneath the bonnet of um, how it works. I'm actually surprised some of the things that you've mentioned that um, you can cobble together for free because, uh, for example, the the analytics you could easily build your own analytics. Um, dashboard, but I know there are services that will um, invite you and happily take your money so that they can feed you back your own analytics. I think you even have to give them your API yeah. for yeah. the privilege. Yeah, it's crazy. So um, the R Studio uh, conference is coming up. I was thinking about building a shiny dashboard for use the Twitter uh, API to pull the hashtags and mm. you know do top hundred tweets, uh, favorites, retweets, that kind of stuff. I can't yeah. go to the uh, the conference, but I think it'd be uh, interesting. Yeah, no, that's cool. Very cool. Any questions? It is a bit information dense, and I'm sorry about that. 
Yeah, I think it's um, it's um, a little overwhelming, actually. I mean, I, I have never even used a GitHub um, workflow, but you've got me thinking about some things. <laughs> it, well, it, I mean, so very interesting. That's what all this is about, I guess, you know, propagating out new ideas and letting people uh, see what's possible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thanks for that, Joe. I'm going to go ahead and stop the uh, recording here. <clears throat> if uh, if you have anything to share, send them on, and I'll um. Yeah, I'll.